Appendix 3, The Christian Relationship to the Mosaic Law by Philip Moreau, The Gentile Believer and the Law. We have said that the experience of the wretched man in Romans 7 is not the normal experience of a converted Gentile. It is nevertheless a sad fact that it may and often does become the abnormal experience of converted Gentiles who, through ignorance of the great gospel truths revealed in Romans or through the influence of Judaizing teachers and legal systems of theology, fall from their standing in grace and seek justification or the grace of the Spirit through law works. Hence the solemn warning of Galatians 5.4 You are depraved of all the effects from Christ, or Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever in law are being justified, ye are fallen from grace. For as there were in Paul's day, so there are now many who desire to be of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. So also the struggle of that wretched man becomes the experience of many unconverted Gentiles who are totally ignorant of remission of sins through faith in the blood of Christ. Ye are seeking perpetually, because seeking vainly, for the inclination of the heart to keep the Mosaic law, the condition of such, if they be earnest and sincere in their desire to keep the law, is indeed wretched in the extreme. It is needful, therefore, that in addition to the revelation given in Romans 7 of deliverance for the believing Jew from the yoke of the law, the epistle to the Galatians should have been incorporated in the word of God in order to instruct and warn Gentile believers against putting themselves under that yoke. In reference, however, to Galatians, our object will be simply to seek the light as it throws upon the conflict described in Romans 7. What we find in Galatians affords a strong confirmation to the view that the experience described in Romans 7 is that of a conscientious, unconverted Israelite and not at all a Christian experience. In fact, the main object of the Apostle in writing to the assemblies of Galatia was to warn them against the teachings which would lead them into such an experience. In Galatians 2, Paul relates how he remonstrated with the Apostle Peter for compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews, that's verse 14. We may be sure that the matter in dispute is esteemed by the Spirit of God to be exceedingly important, otherwise it would not be brought to our attention in the form of a rebuke administered by the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles, to Peter the leader of the Twelve. In this connection, Paul draws the line sharply between Jew and Gentile, saying, we Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified out of the works of the law, but out of the faithfulness of Christ. Even we, that's the Jews, have believed in Christ. Jesus, that we might be justified out of the faithfulness of Christ and not out of the works of the law. Verse 15 to 16. He adds, For if I build again the things I threw down, I constitute myself a transgressor. That is to say, if he should set up the law again as an obligation to himself, he would make himself to be a lawbreaker. For he continues, I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Here Paul again brings himself forward as a typical Jew, repeats a few words, the doctrine elaborated in Romans 7. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, for as the Greek may equally be rendered, I am no longer living. It is Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. It is possible for every believer to reach the place where he can make this saying of Paul his own. It involves death to sin and life to God in Christ, and the abiding presence of the Spirit of him who raised up Christ from the dead. This verse obviously contains a condensed statement of the truth revealed in Romans 6 and 7 concerning the believer's death as to his old nature with Christ and his living again in the supernatural life of the risen Christ. This new life is not lived under the law of Sinai. Or, I do not, says Paul, make void the grace of God, as Peter was doing by his dissimulation and by returning to the practice of Judaism. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Verse 21. In Galatians 3 writes, Having thus dealt with the case of the believing Jew, 
who had been delivered from the law by means of Christ's death, the apostle directly addresses the Gentiles, who, being Gentiles, never were under the law, but began their relationship with God in the Spirit. The Jews began in service to God in the flesh. For him, therefore, there might be found some excuse for continuing after conversion as a man in the flesh under the law, not exercising the liberty wherewith Christ has made him free. But for Gentile believers, who never were under the law, but had the great advantage of beginning in the Spirit, to put themselves under law and to attempt to be perfect in the flesh was the senseless action of those who had been bewitched. O senseless Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should act thus after the truth concerning Christ crucified had been plainly set before you? Are you so senseless, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? It was indeed senseless in the extreme to undertake the perfecting in the flesh of the work that began in the Spirit. The Apostle then refers to Abraham, whose faith was counted to him for righteousness, and points out that the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen out of faith, proclaimed that good news to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations, that's Gentiles, be blessed. Galatians 3 verse 8. The Galatians were warned of two serious facts. First, Paul teaches that all who are of the works of the law, in contrast to those who are of the flesh, are under the curse of the law. Second, he asserts that the curse came upon everyone who continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. From this, it follows that no one, no one, is being justified with God in virtue of law. For the just shall live by faith, but the man that does those things required by the law shall live in virtue of them. Verse 10 to 12. In view of this, it would be natural to ask, how does it come about that the Jews, who were placed under the law, which none of them has kept, have escaped from the curse of the law? The answer is Christ has redeemed them, that's the Jew, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. This statement manifestly solely applies to Israel, for the curse of the law was never pronounced against the Gentiles. Hence Paul's uses in verse 3, 13, the pronoun us. The contrast between Jew and Gentile is again clearly marked by 3.14, which goes on to say that Christ was made a curse for the Jews in order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. The contrast between the curse of the law, pronounced upon those who were under the law, and the blessing of Abraham coming to the Gentile believers in Christ is very instructive. And an additional result of the endurance of Christ of the curse of the law is then set forth, namely, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise was made to Abraham and to his seed long before the law was given. From this it follows that the law, which was given 430 years after, cannot nullify the promise. If then the law, which was not given for the purpose of adding anything to the promise or of taking anything from it, why was it given? It was added for the sake of transgressions, that is, in order that the repeated transgressions of the law by every Israelite might reveal the presence and nature of sin in the flesh and show the futility of attempting to secure justification out of institution, but only until the seed should come, to whom the promise was made, 3.19. This statement shows that the period of law was strictly limited in time, as it was limited also in scope to the children of Israel. Its era did not begin until 430 years after God had begun to deal with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their descendants, and it ceased when the promised seed died under the law. The curse of the law was exhausted when Christ was made a curse by hanging upon the tree. Deuteronomy 21 verse 23. Whatever God's purpose were with the law, they were all accomplished when the promised seed died on the cross. Since that event, even the Jew is no longer under law. But by no amount of law-keeping can he now secure the promised blessings of the promised land. The old covenant is entirely at an end. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 2, 11, Hebrews 7 to 13. The words on the cross, it is finished, in the original, it is the single word accomplished, including the purpose of the law, which thereupon came to an end. The temporary characteristic of the law 
as a divine institution is further set forth with great clearness in the verses 23 to 25. Before faith came, says the Apostle, we Jews were kept or guarded under the law, having been shut up to the faith which was about to be revealed. Moreover, the law had been our pedagogue, that's tutor, up to Christ, in order that we, out of faith, might be justified. But faith having come, we are no longer under a tutor. But, noting the tense of the verbs, as given in the above renderings, the sense will be readily and clearly apprehended. It is very clear indeed that these statements apply only to Israel. The Gentiles were not kept under the law, but were left without law. They were not shut up in any way, but allowed to follow the devices of their own hearts. They were not under a pedagogue or under tutors, governors. Galatians 4.2 For God had no dealings with them. God, God has called Israel his son. Hosea 11.1 See Amos 3.2 And of Israel alone, of all the peoples of the earth, can it be said that they were under tutors, waiting the time appointed of the Father. After speaking in the first person of the Jews, the Apostle addresses the Gentile Galatians, says, by way of contrast, for you are all the children of a God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptised into Christ, having put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. The contrast between the we of verse 24 and 25 and the you of verse 26 is very significant. Some of the statements in Galatians 4 are broad enough to embrace both Jew and Gentiles, for both were, before conversion, in bondage to the elements of the world. But the special bondage of the Jew, the yoke of the law, and the penalty of its curse, is also specifically mentioned, as the heir is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that is we, Jews, might receive the status of sons. But because ye Gentiles are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 4, 2-6 The effective reading of verse 6 in the AV, and because ye are sons, instead of but, as it is in the original, hides the contrast between the case of the believing Israelites and that of the believing Gentiles. The former needed to be redeemed from under the law before he could receive the status of a son, adoption of sons. Whereas for the latter, there was no such need. The bondage of the Gentiles was a different kind of bondage. They, not knowing God at all, were in bondage to those who by nature were no gods, or eight. But the point we wish to examine is that they were not under law at any time. And this point is very clearly presented in the passage we have been examining. In emphasising the important truths that the believer is not under the law, because if a Jew, he was delivered from the yoke of the law by the death of Christ. And if a Gentile, he was never under the law at all, must not obscure the important fact that the state of the believer is not one of lawlessness, far from it. What is spoken in Romans 7 as the law is the law given to the Israelites through Moses. That law was by no means a complete statement of God's requirements, though it was quite sufficient for the purpose of revealing the presence of sin in the flesh and for demonstrating the utter corruptness of human nature and for making manifest the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The teachings of Jesus Christ showed that the full requirements of God's holiness and righteousness are far above those of the law of Moses. Ye have heard it was said by or to them of old, ye shall not kill. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause, etc. Matthew five twenty one to 48 The believer of this dispensation is not living under the law of Moses. That law was given for the regulation of the conduct of men in the flesh. The believer is not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Romans 8 verse 9. He is not therefore in the sphere in which the law of Moses was effective. The child of God, though not under law of Moses, is not without law to God, but in law to Christ. 
1 Corinthians 9.21. He owns the risen Christ as his Lord and judges that his entire life in the body is to be lived no longer unto him, but unto him who died for him and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5.15. Being in the Spirit, he is to be governed by the law of the Spirit. Being in Christ, he is to fulfil the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2. This is a condition very different from that of the Israelite under the law of Moses, and on a much higher plane. The life of the child of God is not a life hedged about by constraints and prohibitions, but a life of liberty in which he is free to follow all the leadings of the Spirit and all the inclinations of the new nature which the Spirit imparts to those whom he quickens. It is a life of freedom, not freedom to sin, but freedom not to sin. He who practices sin is the slave of sin. Only the free man can refuse obedience to the demands of sin and yield himself to God as one who is alive from the dead. The word of God abounds in directions addressed to the children of God by which they walk and while yet in the body is to be guided and controlled. These directions are found in the commandments of Christ and in the epistles of the Apostle Paul whom the risen Lord empowered to be the channel for the revelation of his special communications to and concerning the church. And these directions are illustrated by the Holy Scriptures. The things which happened to the Israelites have been written, not for our imitation, but for our admonition. 1 Corinthians 10.11 The believer has been called into liberty, and he is exhorted to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made him free. Galatians 5.1 Yet he is not to use his liberty as to furnish occasions for gratifying the desires of his old nature. Galatians 5.15 Having been brought through the resurrection of Christ into the sphere of the Spirit, the believer is commanded to remain there, that is, to be occupied with and interested in the things of the Spirit. While so engaged, he cannot at the same time be fulfilling the desires of the flesh. This, I say then, walk in or by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 If ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under law. Galatians 5.18 Ephesians, which especially reveals the position of believers, is quickened together with Christ, raised up, i.e. ascended, together with him, and seated together in the heavenlies, in Christ, abounds in practical directions for the believer's guidance in all the earthly relations. We call attention to them in order to guard against the supposition that because the believer of this dispensation is not under the law of Moses, he is therefore in a state of lawlessness. The main point then of the teaching we have been examining are these. 1. The sufferings of Christ were incurred for the sins of his people. That is to say, the sins of those whom God justifies upon the principle of faith. That the death of Christ delivers the believing sinner whether Jew or Gentile, from the servitude of sin. 3. The death of Christ also brought the economy of the law to an end and delivered all converted Israelites from the yoke of the law. That the resurrection of Christ brings all believers into the sphere of a new humanity where there is new life, whose source is the risen Christ, which life is imparted by the Spirit of God to the believer while the latter is yet in the mortal body. 5. The believers, though not under the law of Moses, are governed by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus and are required to fulfil the law of Christ.